Hey, welcome back to another very exciting tutorial here at the Photoshop Training Channel.com. My name is Jesus Ramirez, and you can find me on Twitter at JR from PTC. In today's tutorial, I'm going to show you how you can use Photoshop CC's 3D features to take a 3D model and composite it into a photograph. This video will teach you how you can work with 3D models and adjustment layers to create realistic compositions. We're going to use this stock image in this 3D model to create the composition. And I'm going to show you several resources that Adobe recommends where you can download 3D models. We're going to start the tutorial by finding the right perspective to place the 3D model. Then I'll show you how to apply materials to various pieces of geometry and how to set IBLs, image-based lights, to help illuminate the scene and create reflections. We'll then use adjustment layers to adjust the brightness and color of the 3D model and also to create the headlights to further enhance the image. After watching this tutorial, you will be equipped with the knowledge to import 3D models into Photoshop and composite them into your own photographs. As you can see with this image, I incorporated the 3D model into a daytime photograph of a street. And in this image, we used a previous tutorial, the cinematic color grading tutorial, and I added the car to one of the parking spaces. This is the same 3D model in all images and the only difference is the lighting that we apply to the image and the different adjustment layers that we're going to set. So by the time you finish watching this tutorial, you should be able to take any 3D model and apply it to a scene and make it look realistic. If you want to follow along, download the background image from my website, PhotoshopTrainingChannel.com. Before we get started with the tutorial, I want to show you the different resources that Adobe provides so you can work with 3D in Photoshop. If you go into the 3D menu, you can choose Get More Content and that's going to bring up a website on photoshop.com that shows you downloadable 3D content. Things that you can download include 3D models and meshes, materials, actions and scripts, stages, and image-based lights. Today we're going to be working with models and meshes. There are seven different websites that Adobe recommends for you to use to find 3D models. The one we're going to use today is TurboSquid. TurboSquid has a section that allows you to search for 3D models that will work with Adobe Photoshop or you can also use one of the different five categories to find your 3D model. For today we're going to use vehicles and TurboSquid is going to show you a different page of 3D models that you can buy. Some of these can be quite expensive for example this taxi cab here is $350 but it has a lot of details so it may be worth the price depending on your project. For this tutorial we're just going to use a free one if you enter the custom price range, you can type in zero and zero and hit apply. And TurboSquid is going to show you all their 3D models in the vehicles category that are free. Most of these probably won't be as detailed as the ones that you pay for, like the taxi cab, but they're great for learning how to use 3D in Photoshop. The 3D model that we're going to use today is the Ferrari 599 GTV 2006. You're going to have to create an account if you don't have one, so create an account with TurboSquid, then you can click on the download button. You're going to go to the downloads page in your account, and a lot of these 3D models have different formats. For example, this one has 3ds Max, Cinema 4D, Lightwave, and OBJ. Photoshop can open a lot of 3D files, but it can't open all of them. And one of the files that it can open is an OBJ file, this file here. So when you download this 3D object, click on the OBJ file to download back in Photoshop. Make sure that you have the starter file. This file is available for download on my website PhotoshopTrainingChannel.com. You can look in the 3D category for this tutorial and let me show you where that is. On my website PhotoshopTrainingChannel.com you can click on 3D and it's going to show you all the different 3D tutorials that I created and find the post for this video and you can download it there. Also while you're on my website feel free to sign up for my free newsletter and I'll send you a new email notification every time I put up a new tutorial and Every Monday morning, I will send you a tip of the day roundup of the previous week's tip of the day. I publish a Photoshop tip of the day, as you can see, it's quite popular. And if you miss any one of those, I'll send a recap every Monday morning. But anyway, back to the tutorial. After you downloaded the 3D file into your computer, click on the 3D menu, and then click on New 3D Layer from File. When you download the file, you're going to have a zip file, but you can extract that and then click on the OBJ file then press open and that's going to bring in the 3D file into Photoshop. Then Photoshop is going to ask you what units of measurements you want to use, inches, centimeters, millimeters, or pixels. Pixels is going to be fine. 
I'm already in the 3D workspace, but if you're not, Photoshop is going to ask you if you want to use a 3D workspace, and you can press OK. So this is our 3D model. If you have the Move Tool selector, you're going to see all the different 3D tools, like the tools to move the scene or 3D object up here, down here, or the top view here. If I have another tool selected, like the Marquee Tool, you won't see any of that. But once I click on the Move Tool, you will. So the first thing we have to do is to make sure that this car matches the perspective of the scene. And if you've seen any of my previous videos where I talk about perspective or the presentation I gave at the headquarters at Adobe, you'll know that one of the most important things is finding the horizon line. The horizon line is simply where the sky meets the ground plane. Here in the layers panel, I'm going to disable the 3D object just so we can see the background. So we need to find out where the sky meets the ground plane in this image. Simply to find the horizon line, you need to look at the converging lines in your image and see the point where they converge, and that'll be your horizon line. So I can click on the line tool, make sure that I have path selected, and click on one of the convergent lines, which in this case could be the sidewalk. Make that line there, and then maybe use this side of the sidewalk. and place that there. So this is the point where the horizon line is and I'm already going to let you know this is probably not 100% accurate but it's close enough and that's what we need to worry about. We need to be close enough. So we're going to say that this horizontal line is the horizon line. If I draw another line just to show you that it's not 100% perfect you'll see. See where this line meets? It meets here so it's not 100% perfect and I know it wasn't because I wasn't perfect when drawing the lines but it's going to be close enough for our purposes. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to click and drag a guide down and this is going to indicate where the horizon line is. If you don't have the rulers active, you can press Control R, Command R on the Mac and then click and drag to make a guide. I'm going to click on the paths panel. I have all the work paths that I created and I'm going to delete them because I don't need them. They were just visual aids to help me determine where the horizon line was. I'm going to click on the layers panel again. I'm going to enable the 3D layer. I'm going to press V in the keyboard to bring up the 3D tools. And one thing I wanted to show you is these lines in the bottom of this grid, that's our ground plane. And our sky is somewhere here. Where is the horizon line in the 3D scene? Well, Photoshop gives us a visual representation of that. Is this gray line going across here? That's our horizon line. So this line needs to match the guide in order to have things in perspective. I can use the tools here in the bottom left, for example the orbit tool, to move the camera around. I'm not necessarily moving the car, the car is in the same place. I'm just moving the camera around. So what I need to do first is match those two lines. I can get them close enough, like here, and then use the coordinates to make a match. By the way, when you click on coordinates, make sure that you actually have the camera selected. And to make sure you have a camera selected, click off to the side here somewhere and make sure there's a yellow line going across the frame of the window here. And then click on coordinates and then you can use the mouse wheel and scroll to move that up or down on the X axis. If you don't have a mouse wheel, you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. And when you get those into place, now you have a car in the right perspective. Now we have to work on other things like scale and placing the car, but that's easier now that we have the car in perspective. If you press enter or return, it's going to accept the changes and now I can use the pan tool to move the car up or down. If this were a flying car, that car's still in perspective. So it's very important to get that horizon line right. What I have to do now is match the ground plane to the ground plane on the image that we're working with. And and I think this is going to match the ground plane right about that height. I'm going to click on the car now. When I click on the car, you're going to get these different tools and I'm going to rotate it a little bit then I'll talk about what they do and the reason I'm going to rotate it is so you can see the icons better. So we get this blue, green, and red handles. And each of those handles has three different other handles that do three different things. The one on the very top that looks like a arrow moves the object in that direction. The arc directly below that, if you click and drag it, rotates the object in that direction. The cube below that scales the object on that axis. I'm going to undo those changes by pressing Control alt c several times. The cube here in the middle scales uniformly, so scales in all the axes, keeps it constrained. So I'm just going to scale that up 
to about the right scale, so somewhere around there. Then I'm going to click on the X axis and rotate it, maybe here, and maybe move it along, push it back a little bit in the Z axis, and push it to the left a little bit on the Y axis, so maybe something like that. And you can play around with the scale, rotation, and movement, and find a spot that works for you. We're just going to leave it here for now. The beauty about 3D is you can always come back and make any adjustments. Maybe you can rotate it later if you want to. So now that I have my car set, I can double click on the 3D layer and I can work on different areas. For example, I can click on the infinite light. The infinite light lights the scene, so I can click on this handle here and move the light around. So where is the light coming from in this particular scene? If you look, there's not too many hints within the image of where light is coming from. So my guess is that the light is probably coming from the top right, I would say. Maybe there's like a lamp post or something here. Maybe I would just leave my light here where I get a little bit of a shadow coming there. And by the way, the shadows that are casted onto the scene are casted onto the 3D plane. You're going to make sure that your object is sitting on the actual plane I scale the objects uniformly on all axes at the same time, so I know that the 3D object is not sitting on the ground plane. So to make it sit on the ground plane, I can go into 3D, move object to ground plane, and notice how that moved up. I get a bigger shadow now. That's because the car is now sitting on the ground. Just so you can see what we have going, I'm going to press M on the keyboard to bring up the marquee tool, and I'm going to make a selection around the car, click on the render button, and Photoshop is going to create a render of what the car looks like now with the current settings applied. I'm not going to let this render all the way through just because it's going to take too long. To, to stop a render, you can press escape on the keyboard and I'm going to disable the selection. I'm going to press control D, command D on the Mac. And I want you to remember that keyboard shortcut, control D or command D on the Mac because I'm going to be using that a lot and I'm not going to keep repeating it. So just remember that if you see a selection and then you see it disappear, that's because I press control D Command D on the Mac. So this is what the car is looking like so far. Obviously it looks very fake, but we're going to work on that to try to make it a little more realistic. And we're going to start out by working with the actual 3D model. I'm going to click on the Move tool. If I click on the 3D model once, it selects the entire 3D model. If I click on it a second time, I can now select each individual part of the 3D model. If I click on the windshield, you notice how this section gets selected, which is titled Windows. And this is all determined by the person who originally created the 3D model. So depending on what 3D model you have, there's different things you can select and they will have a different name. If I click on the body of the car, it's going to select the car body. So that's what we're going to work with next. We're going to give this car a color. I want this car to be red. So if I click on diffuse, which is going to be the color applied to that section of the 3D mesh, and I'm going to select red. Then I'm going to press OK. Our car is now red. If I press M on the keyboard, make a small selection, click on render, you'll see that the car is now red, it's no longer gray, and obviously that's displayed here in the preview. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to work with the light a little bit. If you notice, there's a shadow here and it's very soft, and you can see soft shadows all over the image, but the shadow in our car is very harsh, so we got to soften that up. I'm going to click on infinite light. Under shadow, I'm going to soften that up. I'm going to bring that all the way up to like 90%. Then I can make a selection here in the bottom where the shadow is and click on render and see what that looks like. The shadow is still there. It's not as hard as it used to be, but there's still a problem. If I make a, a bigger render, I could probably explain it a little bit better. The car is too bright and we're in a night scene and the problem is, is that the infinite light is casting way too much light. So what we need to do is we need to bring the intensity of that light down. Right now it's set to 90%. I'm going to bring that way down. Maybe. We'll see what 13% looks like. I still have my selection. I'm going to render that and we'll see the result. And one of the things you got to keep in mind is when you're working with 3D, you're going to be doing this a lot. You're going to make an adjustment. You're going to make a selection, render it out and see what that looks like. And then from there, you can, might make another adjustment or move on to the next area. And I think this is going to work for now. The shadow is still soft. It's barely noticeable. That's what I want. And there's not a lot of light here, which is good because it's a night scene. What we're going to work on now is creating the reflections of the car that are going to make it look like the car is actually on the street. To do so, we're going to need to work with the image based light. I'm going to go into Edit Texture to edit the image based light. This right now is what's giving the reflections in the car. Obviously, this is not going to reflect the buildings. To do so, 
I gotta go back into our start file, click on layers. I'm gonna click on this icon here to collapse a 3D layer so we can keep things clutter free and you can see what I'm about to do. I'm gonna click on the background layer and then I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna duplicate the layer. I wanna duplicate the layer into the image base light right here, default IBL. Then I'm gonna press OK. If I go back into the image base light, you'll see that the layer was copied over to the image base light, but it's too big, but we can make the canvas larger by clicking on the crop tool and clicking and dragging to make it as big as the image we brought in. I'm gonna press Control E, Command E on the Mac to merge those layers because we don't need the one below it. I could have also deleted it, either or works fine. I'm gonna click on the X and it's gonna ask me if I wanna save. Yes, I do want to save, I'm gonna press OK. And now the image base light is applied to the car. You can't really see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press V to bring my 3D options and click on the 3D layer. I'm going to double click on it. I'm going to click on car body. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the reflection of the car body to about 35%. Now you can see some of the buildings being reflected on the body of the car. I'm also going to click on the windshield to select the windows mesh. And I'm going to increase the reflection of that maybe to about 90% and you can see some of the buildings being reflected onto the window. If I had a 3D model with an interior, meaning that the modeler modeled the seats, maybe a driver inside of there, then I would probably bring the opacity down just so we can see inside of the car, but if I bring the opacity down in this car, there's nothing inside, so it's definitely gonna look fake, so I'm just gonna increase the reflection really high and just work with what we have. I'm gonna do a quick render now just so you can see what applying the image face light to the 3D model does. And I don't need to render it all the way, I'm just gonna press escape now. And you can see here that the windshield and the car are reflecting the buildings around it now. We can control those reflections by clicking on environment, clicking on the move tool, and using this orb and rotate it to decide what's gonna be reflected around the car. So you can just find whatever spot you think will work and I'm trying to get a little bit of the sky and a little bit of the buildings on the windshield. That's what I'm looking for. So I sort of like this area because I see some buildings here on the right and sky and buildings here on the left. So maybe, maybe something like that. Then I'm going to click on the marquee tool and do a quick render just so we could see what we have. So I'm going to press escape to stop the render and things are looking pretty good. I still think the 3D model is too bright. This time is because of the image based light, not the infinite light. So I'm going to bring the intensity down on the image based light, maybe about 25%. And I can do a render just to see what that looks like. And I can already tell this is much better. The car actually looks like it belongs in this scene now more. So I'm just going to keep that there. Now I'm going to apply materials to the rims and the headlights. So I'm gonna click on the move tool, click on the card twice, click on the headlights, and it's actually called glass. I'm gonna bring the opacity down just because I wanna show you there's some detail inside of there. See that? So those are the headlights. And I'm gonna click on diffuse, which is the color, make them light gray. And I'm gonna add some illumination. I'm just gonna brighten it up. Maybe this color gray. And I'm going to make a selection around the lights and I'm going to render it. I'm going to leave the lights like that. I could keep playing around with the diffuse and the illumination to make them seem brighter, but I'm going to use lens flares to create the lights and then I'm going to add a layer with light beams. So this is going to be good enough for now. One thing you want to do when you're working in 3D is save often. So I'm going to save now. I'm going to press Control S and just save this as a PSD file because anytime you're working with Photoshop, especially with 3D, you want to save often. Now that we don't need the guy that shows us the horizon line, I'm going to disable it. So I'm going to press Control semicolon to get rid of that. I'm going to press the V key to access the 3D tools because I have the 3D object selected. And now I'm going to work on the rims of the car. I'm going to click on the rims here and it's called Rim Glossy. And I'm just going to increase the reflection all the way up just because I think the rims would be really reflective and maybe increase the shine as well. I'm going to press M, make a selection around the rims 
and do a render just to see what the outcome of my changes were. And I can already tell that's going to work, so I'm just going to press escape. And I went a little fast in making those adjustments, and you probably didn't catch the exact numbers that I used, but that's okay. You don't need to look exactly at the same settings that I use because things will be different on your screen. You probably didn't set the image-based light in the same spot that I did. You probably didn't set the 3D model in the same exact spot that I did. So there's a lot of variables, so keep that in mind. You don't have to apply the same exact settings that I have. Instead, look at the techniques and try to apply them yourself to your own composition. What I'm going to do now is just I'm going to render this out just a little bit more, actually. So so we can work off of it. And we're going to use the tools in Photoshop to take this image further. If you look at the left hand corner here at the bottom, it says time remaining 816. That's 8 minutes and 16 seconds. So I'm going to pause the video, let it render all the way. That way we can work with a full render when we use the other tools. Okay, now that my image is rendered, we can continue working with this and we're going to use adjustment layers and several other techniques to make this a more realistic composition. I'm going to click on the layers panel and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a black and white adjustment layer. And this is a trick that I like using whenever I create compositions, I like to create a black and white adjustment layer at the very top and see if the luminance values of the two images match. In this case, the background and the car and the car seems a little too light compared to the rest of the scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a curves adjustment layer right above the car and I'm going to clip to it. You can make a clipping mask by pressing Control alt g Command Option G on the Mac, or you can hover in between the two layers while holding Alt Option on the Mac and clicking to create that clip. Then I'm going to change the blend mode to luminosity because I only want to affect the luminance values of the car layer. I think two things need to happen. I think that the car needs to be a little bit darker and it needs a little more contrast. So I'm going to start out by using a preset and I'm going to use the medium contrast preset. And notice the difference. This is before and after. So the car looks like it fits a little bit more now that I made it darker and created some contrast. I can adjust the points to make it match just a bit better and maybe something like that. So I think that the darkest parts of the car match the darkest parts of the background and the lightest parts of the car match the lightest parts of the background and that's what makes it seem like it belongs in that scene. So this is before and this is after. If we disable the black and white adjustment layer, we see the result with color before and after. It might be a little too saturated. I'm not sure yet. We're going to keep working with it and if we need to desaturate the car later on, we will. I know we have the shadow that we created using the ground plane and the infinite light, but we still need some contact shadows, the shadows that are directly below the areas touching the ground. So I'm going to click on the background layer, add one layer, and I'm going to call it contact shadow. I'm going to press B on the keyboard to bring up the brush tool and use the bracket keys to make it larger. I have black as my foreground color and I can paint in those contact shadows right below the tires and then I can bring the opacity down by clicking and dragging on the word opacity and maybe leaving them around 76 percent. I'm going to zoom out so that's before and after. It just makes it just a little bit more realistic and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one more layer and I'm just going to darken up the shadows underneath the car just a little bit so and bring the opacity down again to zero and then just bring it up until I find an opacity that I like so at about 67 percent and I'm just gonna call this under car shadow what I'm gonna do now is work on the light beams for the headlights so I'm gonna click above the curves layer and I'm going to fill this layer with black by holding Alt and Backspace, Option and Backspace on the Mac. And that fills with the foreground color, which in this case is black. I'm going to disable the layer, press V on the keyboard, and open up the Info panel. The Info panel is here. If you don't have it there, you can go into Window and click on Info. Notice that as I move through the Info panel, the X and Y coordinates of the canvas show up. 
if I hover over the light here, you'll see that the X coordinate is 562 and the Y coordinate is 463. So you have to remember those numbers 562 and 463. Then I'm going to enable the layer, go into Filter, Render, Lens Flare, and if I hold Alt, Option in the Mac, and click anywhere inside that square, you get the precise flare center, and you can input those numbers 562, 463, and press OK. And you can choose 105 millimeter prime and brightness of about 55% is good, then press OK. And Photoshop automatically places that lens flare in exactly that spot. You can switch the blend mode to screen and you see it's right on top of that headlight. To save some time, I'm just going to duplicate this layer by holding Alt, clicking and dragging, and placing it directly on top of the other headlight, maybe using the arrow keys and the keyboard to place it better. What you should do instead is just use the precise flare to create another lens flare, but we don't have the time for that. I'm going to paint with black just on this green glare there just to get rid of it. Just We only need one. I'm going to put these two layers into a group, so I'm going to hold Shift and click on both. Press Control G, Command G on the Mac to put it into a group, and I'm going to call it Lens Flares, just so I know what they are. I'm going to bring the opacity down to maybe about 69-70%, and now I'm going to create the beams that are going to come out of that car. I'm going to create an exposure adjustment layer above the curves layer, so I'm going to click on curves and create an exposure adjustment layer. Then I'm going to increase the exposure to about 230. I have a layer mask, but I want to add a vector mask now, so I'm going to click on the layer mask icon. I'm going to click on the layer mask, right click on it, and click on delete layer mask. So now I only have the vector mask. And the vector mask allows us to use the pen tool to create a mask. I'm going to click on the pen tool, click above the beam, and make my beams using the pen tool, like so. And I'll show you why I'm doing this in a moment. So now we have our beams. Then, with our vector mask selected, I can click on feather and feather those beams. And what that does is it creates a soft edge and makes the beams a little more realistic. The reason I use a vector mask is because we can use the direct selection tool and click on these points and adjust the beams as we see fit. So it's a lot easier than controlling the beams if I would have just painted white on a layer mask. We can spend a whole lot of time adjusting these beams to make them more realistic, but just for the sake of time, we'll just call this good for now. I also want to add some highlights on the ground that these beams are creating. So right below the exposure adjustment layer, I'm going to add another layer, and I'm going to paint with white, just a dot. I'm going to press Control T to transform, hold Alt, Option in the Mac, scale that out like so, and press Enter. Then I'm going to set the blend mode to overlay. I'm going to press Ctrl J to duplicate that layer, and I'm going to press Ctrl T again, and I'm going to bring that in a little bit. So now I have two layers, and they're both set to overlay. I'm going to select them both by holding Shift, and then with the Move tool selected, I'm going to press Alt, click and drag, and move that over to the right side to create another highlight for this beam. So now we have two highlights on the ground for the light beams. Then I'm going to press Enter. I'm going to select all four layers by holding Shift and clicking on the bottom one and the top one, pressing Control G, and I'm just going to call this Ground Highlight. So now we have these highlights on the ground. You can play around with the opacity if you want to, in case you don't want those highlights to be so strong. So probably about 50 to 60 percent is a good number to have in this case. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply another light to the back of the car because maybe the car is stopped and they're pushing on the brakes, so we need some brake lights in the back. So I'm going to click below the 3D layer, which is the Ferrari layer, and add a new layer. This time I'm going to choose red for my foreground color, and I'm just going to make a dot, like so. Then I'm going to press T to transform, right click on it, control click on the Mac, click on perspective, and drag one of the edges until you sort of match the perspective of the ground. Then press Enter. 
press V to move, click and drag this right behind the car, wherever you think that light would be, and set the blend mode to linear dodge, and that's kind of what that looks like there, but I don't want it to be completely visible. And you can play around with the scale of it to make it more realistic and sort of play around and move it around and place it in an area that you think the light would be if there was a brake like shining light behind the car. So maybe something like that. And I'm just going to call this layer brake light. So now that we've made all these adjustments, one of the things that I'm not too happy with is these flares here. So maybe I can bring the opacity of the light beams down a little bit. Maybe there, because I want some of that detail in the light to show. And actually, maybe I do need a layer mask. So I'm going to add a layer mask, and I'm just going to paint with black inside of there and maybe fade it a little bit to bring that down and click on here and fade it as well. You can play around with the fade and find a spot that you like so maybe something like that. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to bring everything together and I'm going to add a color lookup adjustment layer. I'm going to select the teal and orange adjustment and that might be too strong so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the opacity down to zero and then drag it up till I find a darkness that I'm happy with. So maybe at about 50%. And I like the darkness of it, but I'm not too happy with the color. So I'm going to press Control J, Command J on the Mac to duplicate that layer. But this time I'm going to set the blend mode to color only to add more of those colors. So if I bring it down to zero, you see where that is. And I can add more of that teal and more of that orange to this image. But maybe not too much. Maybe. Maybe we'll leave it at 29%, which is close enough to 30%. So this is before and after. It's just a subtle change, but it just makes things seem a little bit darker. Now, something you may want to do, depending on how your car is looking, I, I don't think I need it too much for this image, but sometimes the car is too saturated. And I created an adjust a hue saturation adjustment layer that is also clipped to the car. And I'm just going to bring it down just a little tiny bit. and before and after. It's just a very subtle change, but I think it helps the image. At this point, you can go back and just make adjustments into areas that you think need the adjustments just to make your car seem a little more realistic. At this point, all you want to do is look at your image and try to see what's working and what's not, and make tweaks and adjustments to the different layers that need work. Or you can even add new ones if you need to. As you saw in the introduction, you can use this technique for almost any 3D model or image. Of course, every image will have its own problems, but by learning the specifics I just showed you, you should be able to overcome them with just a little work and some creativity. And that's it for this tutorial. As always, I hope that you enjoyed it and that you learned something new. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below. If you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and my newsletter. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and share it with a friend. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon.